uh, a modified uh, version, uh, and we look forward to having the full version next year um, due to, to the pandemic we're all living through. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're gonna do some technology housekeeping and then we'll get started. So we will um, keep everyone on mute so that we can focus on the presenters that are um, talking through the slides. And we will be recording this session and also capturing the chat boxes. So we just wanted to make you aware of that um, due to the Florida laws. And uh, the recording is happening with our partner at the University of Tampa, Tim Harding. So um, this will be recorded. Um, and so you'll want to manage your, um, your Zoom technology appropriately if that is an issue for you. We will provide a copy of lots of things for you uh, at the end of this because we'll have a lot of information. It's a lot to take in. Um, we don't want you to have to be frantically writing notes. So you'll get all of the slides in a PDF format and all the links will be clickable. Um, you'll get a recording of the webinar and the chat transcript. So if folks are sharing things in the chat box, you'll be able to have access to that. We'll also provide you access to what we call blueprints, which are uh, something that we use when we do the in-person symposium. We ask people who have good competency programs rolling to provide kind of a one-page snapshot of their work. And so um, those will be available to you from the past two symposiums as well um, in the resources that we'll provide, as well as a downloadable copy of what we call the workbook. And that is something that our participants every year say are so helpful. It's got a lot of good discussion questions, a lot of good guidance, things to consider for each of the four pillars. Um, and so you will have access to that as well um, in, the, in the documents that we send you. Please feel free to use the chat feature. We would love for you to share ideas, share links, share resources as our presenters are talking about things. Also, please ask questions. We're going to be moder we're going to be monitoring the chat room so that if there are questions, we'll have a time at the end of each pillar, um, each of our four pillars, for those questions to be brought forward to our presenters. So if you do have a question, don't be shy. Please ask that, and we will um, keep track of those and then um, bump them up to the presenters at the end of each pillar. When you ask a question, please include your name and institution so that we can uh, can address it and, and just know more about who's asking that question. Um, and so that is our technology housekeeping and then we will get started. So um, just wanted to say thank you um, for your understanding. Um, it was it was sad for the team to have to cancel our in-person gathering in Austin, but we knew it was what we needed to do. And so we appreciate you guys hanging with us and coming to the webinar today. We hope this is just enough to wet your whistle and get you started on the competency um, pathway and that you will plan to join us next year at UT Austin because um, we're gonna have some fantastic things in store. And one of the best things about this symposium is the ability to um, talk to other folks about what they're doing and learn from others and share ideas and discuss. And you can't, you can't get that on a Zoom call, but you can get that in person. So I really hope you'll join us next year. And just thank you for all you're doing to support students in this unprecedented time. It's a, it's a time like nothing we've ever faced before <laughs> in, in career services. So um, we really uh, appreciate your understanding and flexibility for this symposium, but also just just all that you're doing to support your students um, in particular. The last thing I want to do is just acknowledge the planning team. So there is a team of folks that works has been working together for a full year um, to put this together for you. Uh, in particular, I want to thank Robert Vega at the University of Texas, Austin. He did lots of planning and logistics for us to come. And then they just poof, <laughs> went away. Um, and he gets to do it all again next year. So uh, thank you so much, Robert, um, for, for doing that. We appreciate you. But we also have a great team from Clemson University that's helping us, Tracy Austin and Kathy Horner and Dr. Kristen Walker Donnelly with Clemson. They've um, led the way a lot in the in the competency world, as well as Tim Harding at the University of Tampa. And so Tim and Kristen are who you'll be hearing from today as kind of the, the leaders of this push for career competencies. I'm Lee Lassiter Counts from Hendricks College in Arkansas. And so all of us together are very pleased to welcome you to this webinar and excited that you want to join us um, in our competency work for our students. So thank you. And I would uh, like to add a special uh, welcome to uh, Dr. Norma Guerra Geyer at the University of Texas Austin. She is the Executive Director of Texas Career Engagement and she's going to talk to us about next year's conference. So Norma, take it away. Well, good morning everyone. Um, it's so nice to be with you. I really wish I had the opportunity to offer this welcome to you in person. 
Um, we can't do that, obviously, but I thought I'd have the, the UT Tower in, in the background for us um, because we would have seen it from our, our site where we would have been meeting. Um, but I do hope that um, each and every one of you are thriving in your work. We're, we're certainly working in such a different way and that you and your families are staying safe um, and healthy. Um, I am really excited that we will be able to offer um, UT Austin as a venue for next year. So we've already made all the, um, the uh, arrangements. And, and again, as Lee said, Robert and, and the UT team have been working hard to make sure that we are ready for you. Um, so May 26th, 27th, 2021, um, we want to see you in Austin. And um, while the content today I know is phenomenal, I participated in the session yesterday, um, you will be blown away with the in-person opportunity to share with one another, as, as you know, um, those, sometimes those breaks and that time to really reflect and, and share one-on-one -on -one and in small groups is um, irreplaceable. Um, I'll, I'll tell you though, you're in for a treat today based on what I, um, I saw yesterday. And um, we just can't wait to, to see you. I hope I see many of you before then, but for sure next year, 2021. And just a, a quick shout out to this incredible planning team. I know that they have been working long and hard for over a year um, on, on this competency symposium and, um, and they're still working hard. So Give them a shout out and thanks when you can. And I wish you the best today as you engage in, in some fun learning. Thanks so much, Norma. We are definitely looking forward to being in the live music capital of the world next summer. So uh, mark your calendars for sure. Um, and just a reminder, we've had a few more people hop on since I said this. So we are recording this webinar. I want to make sure that you're aware of that. We'll be recording um, the audio as well as the chat box. Use that feature to ask questions and share ideas. Um, and, and we just want to make sure you're aware of that. So we will get started now. I'm going to pitch it to Robert, who's going to share with us the poll information and then we'll get going on our pillars. Thanks so much for joining us today. 49 people um, online with us today, uh, of which uh, 37 are from uh, career, our career centers. We have four campus partners, one faculty, one senior administrator, and um, one other person who identified as other. Sorry, we were just trying to make sure there were no people left in the waiting room. Um, so if you have a colleague that's saying they're in the waiting room, please let us know again, but uh, it looks like everyone is here. So um, I actually just disabled the waiting room um, for that purpose. Hopefully we won't get Zoom bombed. Um, so Robert's on the ready in case someone does uh, try to Zoom bomb. So again, thank you for being with us. Uh, my name's Tim Harding. I'm at the University of Tampa, um, and I am one of the folks that um, set out on this mission some years back uh, in December of 2016, um, when we began discussions about how in the world do we um, forward the competency development and, and evolve it into such a way that our students are um, prepared for the world of work and successful. Uh, the way that this all began was a conversation between uh, University of Tampa staff and Clemson staff after um, we both had um, some opportunities to begin and launch our competency development initiatives. And obviously, Clemson is very different than the University of Tampa being a large research institution and uh, University of Tampa being a, a medium-sized comprehensive private institution. Um, our institutions were very different 
um, and we were approaching career development, or I'm sorry, competency development um, in different ways, but um, we, were, we were having some outcomes that were showing success. And we felt like it was important for us to get a group of people together to begin to explore um, how, to, how to further this. So we, we conceived of the first um, symposium in um, the spring of 2017. We anticipated we might have 30 schools represented, maybe even 30 people around the table, but uh, we ended up with 180 at that, which showed that um, we had hit a nerve that people needed to gather around this topic and figure out um, how to infuse competency development into uh, their own initiatives. In creating the symposium, what we did realize is that there's no single model that you can use. So we're not here today to give you a plug and play. Um, and I know some of you may wish we were able to do that. I wish we could do that. But with the uniqueness of all of our institutions, what we want to provide for you are some pillars uh, on which you can develop your own unique competency development initiative um, that is bigger than just one department. So as we saw, a lot of the folks in uh, this, this gathering today are from career services. Uh, and while it seems natural for competency development um, as it relates to career readiness coming from that particular department, it cannot and should not live in that department alone if it's going to be as impactful as, as we think that it should be. Um, so this competency development symposium uh, is really about developing a university-wide initiative. And so this is intended to be a catalyst for continuing conversation. Um, we hope that what this does is prime your brain uh, to think about how you can build on the four pillars um, and develop your own unique approach to university-wide competency development. Now we will be talking about career readiness periodically, um, and I'm having trouble with my mouse again today, so I apologize for that. Um, career readiness and career will come out of the discussion along the way. Um, we just want to recognize that we're using the NACE definition um, and um, the NCDA definition for what career and career readiness is when we talk about those two. Um, but I would like to say that we need to also remember that competency development in a context of a university-wide institutional approach needs to consider the fact that career readiness is actually a part of student success. So in my world um, at University of Tampa, for example, we really talk more about student success um, and career readiness being a part of that because these competencies really uh, touch so many other areas. We did do a little bit of adjustment to some of the pillars. So some of you who may have seen those in the past will note that we are making sure that the pillars are dynamic and relevant. Um, and so we, we are looking at trends and consideration of, of competency development. Um, so it, it, they're going to continue to evolve. You'll see those edits in blue as we go along. So I'm going to hand it over to Kristen to give us a little bit of an outline of the day or the, the time we have together. Excellent. Thanks so much, Tim. So we're going to take an approach and kind of uh, rinse and repeat, if you will, with how we approach our four pillars. So we're going to share the definition with you. Um, you'll be able to see kind of the main points and where those edits are in blue, like Tim just mentioned. We're going to share with you some basic discussion questions that can help um, engage you and your colleagues in conversations at your respective institutions. And there are also additional questions and charts and things that you can work through related to each pillar in the workbook that Lee mentioned when going over some uh, things at the top of our webinar today. Then just like theory to practice, we're going to give you pillar to practice. So we're going to share with you some actual examples from um, some of our own institutions, as well as some of our colleagues at other institutions. We've got some screenshots that we'll share with you. And whenever we were able to find a link that would provide you with direct access to learn more about that program, we've provided that on the slide for you. So you'll be able to access that um, either later today or tomorrow uh, through the presentation. 
We're going to share with you briefly one slide for each pillar on the data from our 2019 surveys, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. And then we'll pause before going to the next pillar to see if there's any questions that we've seen in the chat box come up. And then we'll conclude today with some qualitative takeaways from our 2019 surveys and some action planning documents and resources. And then again, just remind you of our 2021 symposium dates. So in terms of the surveys, um, we did two surveys and we've done that after each one of our symposiums. There's the immediate follow-up where we are asking our attendees some questions regarding some logistics and about the event itself. But we are also asking our attendees to tell us on a scale of one to 10, where are you with this pillar of your competency development uh, institution-wide initiative? So you can see here that we had a lot of individuals respond, which is really great, but I also wanted to give you an institutional response rate um, so that way you had that information as well. For a four month out, we wanted to give some distance. So the event as uh, to, was would have been yesterday and today, which is about this week every year. So then in September, we send out a four month out to see now where are you on that scale of one to 10. And we also collect some information about some roadblocks and things that you may wanna pass along to colleagues. So we'll share that information with you as well. But we had lower response rates, as you would expect, both on the individual and institution level. We know that that is career fair time, which can sometimes be a barrier to a higher response rate. But also some institutions say, well, we brought a team of five, but you respond on behalf of our institution. So just to be fully transparent with the data that we'll be sharing with you today. So with that, I will turn the floor back over to you, Tim, I believe, to begin with pillar one. Great, thanks, Kristen. So as we work our way through the pillars, I wanna draw attention to the fact that we um, are using a building metaphor as, as we consider this. And, and our rationale for this is when we thought about how can we best serve any type of institution? Um, doesn't matter public, private, large, small, community college, um, or four-year institution. Um, and so it, when we considered models, you know, we thought about, well, what's the recipe? What, what makes this work? The recipe is scientific. It has specific ingredients that you must put into something um, in order to uh, make it work uh, and, and be successful uh, in the outcome. Um, and you really don't want to deviate from those. That model really didn't fit for us, but what we did find as we were thinking about a metaphor is a building metaphor. And, and for anyone who might've built a, a house or some kind of structure on their own, that, that you know it starts with a foundation. Um, and so the pillars are intended to be that foundation. Um, they are not pillars that you have to do uh, one right after the, or, or one right after the other or sequentially. Um, they are ones that you can work on all at the same time, and um, you can invest more in one particular pillar at a time, but you do not have to do pillar one first, pillar two, pillar three, and then pillar four. Um, so we want to launch into an understanding of the conceptualization and planning. So you have to have a blueprint going into this. And the basic blueprint is the understanding of what you want your home to be like. Um, and when we talk about um, institution-wide, this is the overall statement that, that we believe um, articulates best what that concept is. So it's competency learning development and articulation should be made apparent and infused into the curriculum and co-curriculum to provide opportunities for students to actively demonstrate competency development and readiness. Framing programs, services, and one-on-one -on -one conversations and competencies provide students with multiple touch points throughout their time at the institution. So the questions that we're really considering with this are, in what ways can your competencies be articulated, discussed, and lived institution-wide? And what we do understand is that if we are going to have the most impact on the most students, the greatest number of students, it must be an institution-wide initiative. Probably, I could safely say that all of us on the call, representing the different areas that we come from, wish that we could see every student. We probably don't have the staff or resources to do that. But just realistically, none of us see 100% of our students. And yet, we want this 
particular initiative um, to be available to every student on campus and throughout our community and for them to have equal access. And so we have to consider that this is not just a career services initiative. It's not just a student affairs. It's not just academic affairs. It is all of those areas um, and working collaboratively that are going to help students realize true competency development. And we need to consider what the access points are. So we know that students are taking classes, so it's a given that we need to figure out how to infuse competency development, recognition, reflection, and assessment into the curriculum, um, into the co-curriculum as well, be it fraternity sorority life, residence life, campus rec, student activities, volunteerism, uh, civic engagement, um, and work-related experience, maybe part-time jobs, student employment, and internships. So we also need to make sure that we understand that this is going to impact our culture. Um, it really is about changing the culture of our institution and realizing that it's an institutional priority. And so we need to consider how we can help others feel ownership of this competency work um, that is so important to our student success. So I wanna give you a few examples to pillars. I'm sorry, pillars to practice. And I'll start with my own institution. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna try not to spend a lot of time on this. I get very excited about what we're doing at University of Tampa and I can ramble on for ages about it um, because I am so excited about it. But the overall concept that I wanted to bring to you um, with this is as we launched our Spartan Ready initiative, which is our competency development initiative across the campus, this came together um, through a collaborative um, idea, brainstorming, um, and development process um, that included both the associate provost um, and, and myself as an associate dean of students. Um, it was not conceived just out of one area, but it was brought together um, with both in mind. Um, and we realized that we couldn't just go out and start to say to people, hey, here are the competencies and you need to develop these um, so you're career ready or whatever. We wanted to give it more of a definition and grounding than that um, because that alone would not just be what we needed to impact the, the campus culture. So we decided that we needed to define what we really meant by our students being Spartan ready. Um, and that's what you see at the bottom of this slide. We defined it as the University of Tampa graduate students who are prepared to be successful individuals with an advanced understanding of their field of study, the interdisciplinary workplace, and how to be leaders who contribute to society. So you see that it's much more than a career readiness initiative, um, and it also is about academic preparation as well. Um, so one of the things that's very important for us is helping people understand that these competencies are competencies that are important for uh, success in the classroom, for example. They're not just about career readiness. Uh, so we have both academics and we have um, co-curricular staff um, who are working toward the end of promoting Spartan readiness with our students. A way in which Clemson has helped to infuse competency development um, into their academic side of the house is to align the competencies, and they're using the NACE career readiness competencies in this case, um, to align those with the accreditation and curricula. And so they started with uh, engineering, business, and nursing. Um, those three areas in particular have uh, established criteria for competency development uh, in their professions and in their accreditation process. Uh, so they work with those departments to align the competency development with them and to ensure that not only are students becoming career ready, but they are meeting the competencies that are required as a part of the accreditation and curricular requirements for those areas. Um, so they are continuing to expand that uh, with other areas as well, and they're mapping um, that learning to the NACE competencies in this case. Another really good example of a university-wide approach to this is out of the University of Michigan at Dearborn. 
they have created a program called the Talent Gateway. Uh, and you'll see the, the link at the bottom here to the Talent Gateway. Um, what this program does is it helps students develop their competencies through a series of reflective ex, uh, um, reflection exercises, um, and they uh, develop um, their competencies by ticking off certain types of activities that they go through. Uh, it's a game of, uh, gamification process that they use, so they make it more of a, a game kind of environment uh, in helping students. I'm sorry, I, my mouse is still having problems. I'm, I, I apologize for that. Uh, so this particular group um, is not just coming out of the Career Center either. It is a combination of um, the career centers, the internship areas, the co-ops, uh, the, the library participates in this collaboration, the alumni office is involved, the civic engagement office participates uh, as a partner in their program, academic advising, their student life area, and their center for social justice and inclusion are all partners that are helping contribute to the talent gateway. Now, one of the interesting things that they did here is they also brought in students uh, that they trained to help be Talent Gateway um, ambassadors um, who are doing the uh, review of student reflections through the experience and offering feedback on that. So it's a great way to include students in this process as well. The next school that I wanted to just highlight very quickly for you is Anderson University uh, in South Carolina. And they put together their AU Pro program, which is uh, their approach to competency development across the institution. And they do uh, a variety of different activities across the institution. But the main thing um, for Anderson University is this is their quality enhancement program that is a part of the SAC COC re requirement for accreditation. So you see that that automatically elevated their competency development uh, beyond just a department or a few partnerships. This is an institution-wide initiative that requires um, assessment uh, and reporting um, across a, a period of time for, for their institutional accreditation. So those are just three very quick examples. If we were in person, you know, we would be doing this over the course of two days and we would go into a lot more depth and give you even more examples and even have you interact on them. Um, but because of our limited time, we just have the ability to scratch the very surface of these and give you a few examples of how folks are beginning to ap approach this uh, institution-wide competency development. Now, the stats that we collected around pillar one demonstrated that as people immediately left the symposium, it looks like I would guess that they probably needed a bit of time uh, to begin to um, let things percolate a bit and decide how they were going to take uh, their approach to this. So immediately there wasn't necessarily any kind of action they were taking. But four months out, uh, almost 66% of the respondents said that, that they had taken action, and my guess is that they were beginning to build those strategies um, that would help them develop the institution-wide initiative. So we'll pause here for some questions, and Tracy, do we have any questions at this point? Sam, I don't see any questions. Um, please feel free to pop questions into the chat box if you have them as we move along. Uh, we'll ch check in periodically to see if you have those. Uh, Tim, I think it was uh, really important uh, what you mentioned with the con conceptualization and planning with your competency initiative to make sure that you're incorporating folks across the campus and not just keeping it in the Career Center. Right, that's, a, that's an integral part of this. It, it needs to be something that is institution-wide uh, in terms of engagement and just not rolling out a program and expecting others to jump on board. Um, so Pillar 2 actually addresses those strategies more, so I'm going to turn it over to Kristen to take us uh, down the path of Pillar 2. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tim. So we made a couple minor revisions here um, and really added that concept that Tim was saying of talking about this as a student success initiative. 
So the value of an institution-wide competency development and career readiness initiative that supports overall student success is apparent when strategic relationships result in the initiative being reflected in institution, division, department, strategic plans, and general education. A common vocabulary and definitions for institution identified competencies provides a shared understanding, buy-in, and brand. One area may take the lead in mobilizing stakeholders while refraining from solely owning the initiative. So as you can see, these built pillars really do build off of one another. So we've already kind of hit that last sentence of this pillar. So let me kind of address a couple other pieces briefly before we move on. Um, yesterday during our webinar, somebody had popped in the chat that they really liked that the University of Tampa had life skills in theirs. And I think it's an important piece to acknowledge here that the National Association of Colleges and Employers, or NACE, came out in about 2015, 2016 with uh, some divine, uh, defined competencies. Since uh, a lot of institutions have begun this, some have adopted those NACE competencies and some have developed their own. As you saw with uh, the University of Tampa, they developed their own. When I was in the role at Clemson University with um, working on this initiative that uh, Kathy Horner, who's with us today, took on, and now Tracy Austin that came to Clemson from Anderson University, who worked on their AU Pro and is now the champion at Clemson for ours, we also decided to create um, different, differing competencies. And there were some reasons for that. In the first iteration, the definition of leadership was bent a little bit more towards positions. And we knew that when we were building momentum, that wasn't going to fly at our campus, that we had much more of a philosophy that leadership is a process. So we needed to not immediately dive into the deep end of the pool and start working on our initiative. We needed to pause and actually identify our own competencies and what those definitions were going to be, which means buy-in, which means a lot of conversations with a lot of stakeholders, getting their feedback, incorporating that feedback on the academic and not academic side of the house. So those were leveraging a lot of relationships that we had built over the years in taking this on. And I think a key difference between pillar one and pillar two is pillar one is let's get it where we can in the curricular and co-curricular. This coalition building really um, builds on momentum that you have gained in those one-off areas to really how do we get it in the strategic plan or things like gen ed where it has a much broader reach to, like Tim said, ensure that all students, especially from an equity standpoint, you didn't have to be in the right place at the right time to take part in a high impact practice or a meaningful experience to develop and articulate these competencies. It's really getting percolated across the entire institution. So hopefully you can see a little bit where that vocabulary is important, where you can brand it, that can really help resonate so that way images pop up and people know how to associate it. So let's look at some examples on how this kind of comes in at a larger standpoint with what some institutions are doing here. Well, actually, I'll go over these questions first. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, so first, who are your stakeholders? So with that, that's an important component. You need to identify who they are. And we're going to give you a tool here in a moment before I give you those examples I mentioned on how to do that. Who is directly or indirectly affected by the lack of or value of one of these efforts? So how do you build your coalition because it will benefit their work or give frame and additional meaning to their work? Or is it somebody like we're going to see in the area of development where we now have a program that is easier to go to donors and be able to talk about that they could be part of that? Who can advocate? We're gonna talk about there's a difference between someone who is actually doing the work and the true value of someone advocating this type of approach or a framework. And you also need to figure out who might be your not so early adopters that you might need to be bringing on later. And again, how can we leverage this relationship continuum that I'm gonna talk about here on our next slide? And Tim, if you wanna go ahead and advance it. So this is something that's available right now on the symposium website and a framework that we have used to help kind of expand on this pillar two topic where you can kind of move people from unfamiliar to partnership. And if you almost think about this like a donor cultivation cycle, you don't ask someone to you know, give to your institution in the first conversation, you need to build that relationship. This kind of concept is very similar to this. 
And Tim, if you wanna advance the next slide, this is what that rubric looks like. And we wanna give a huge shout out to the University of Connecticut four years ago that Tim knew that this continuum existed. And it had to do with how the University of Connecticut framed their relationships as a career center with different entities across their institution. And we said, this is really good. Can, do you mind if we adopt this for what do people know or how can they be a champion and advocate um, of the a competency initiative? So I know this is super small, my eyesight is awful. So there's the full PDF that you can download on our website, but we want you to see this as a framework to be able to identify where are stakeholders now and where do they, we want them to be. And much like your student development theories, it's not just that partnership is the best, you may not need someone to be at that true partnership level. If there's a senior level administrator there that you need in that advocacy role, that's super important. They're not delivering the program, but they are helping to bring people on board with that program. So think about intentionally, where are folks currently and where do you want them to be? So now, as I promised, we'll go ahead and to dive into some of those examples of this pillar uh, to practice in action. And you're gonna see with these examples how it's much larger. We've seen in collecting data over the last several years that different institutions have had some sort of committee or task force that has been the champion where we don't want it to be out of a department, but we want a cross-functional committee or task force or whatever you wanna call it that is going to have faculty, staff, student representation, and that can serve in a variety of roles. And they may be doing some of the behind the scenes work to take the burden off of some folks um, across the institution. It may be that they're doing some of the um, analysis with some of the assessment data. It may be that they're helping to create tools that the entire institution can use. So this is a great way to leverage it and have it not be a group that is just functioning out of one department. And specifically at the University of Tampa, they have this steering committee, but it's also reflected in their division strategic plan. Um, I actually had the um, opportunity to engage with Tim and their division of student affairs staff, and they invited some non-student uh, affairs folks to attend an all-day retreat on how do we get Spartan ready, again, to go across um, the institution in ways that it hadn't been, and how do we almost take what you're doing from good to great. And you'll see um, this graphic currently isn't on their website, but in the top kind of 11 o'clock position on the clock, you see Spartan Ready Culture. They are espousing as a division that this is a strategic priority for their division of student affairs. So I think that's an important component that it's out there front and center. If you're a new employee or switching areas of the institution, that immediately prompts the question of what is this and how can I get involved? Um, another area that it's involved with in Tampa, which I think is really neat, and if we advance to the next slide, Tim, um, is the area of development. And I think that's really important. This is a screenshot that I captured to um, show their own staff, like, did you know that this is even reflected in development and how they are um, selling this concept and the impact that they are making on students and the um, quality of the University of Tampa degree and the reputation of the type of graduates that the institution helps to put out into the world. So I've got some couple arrows there for you where I just think it's really interesting how Spartan Ready can truly be used anywhere and your initiative could really be used anywhere. This is probably not a first step that you would end up taking, but this is how it can help impact um, the entire institution as a whole once you're kind of um, getting your uh, pieces together and making those collaborations and coalitions work to your um, advantage. And if we look at the next slide, I can show you another example with B Hendrix, Beyond Hendrix, and their website is still kind of coming about. And one thing that we've learned is getting that landing page is really um, an obstacle because you do have to work with different, uh, different groups across your institution. But this is some really important information here where it may be, how do I get some early adopters or people that are working on initiatives that this can easily plug into what's going on and how do we get them on board? How do we show them that this is part of a national conversation that also has to do with student learning outcomes and how we can maximize resources, which right now that is definitely where we're at. And we'll talk about that resource um, component in pillar three in a moment. 
But I think it's really important, again, to see bringing people on board strategically and building your coalition is important. The next up we have in terms of the uh, Georgia State University, you saw us um, or heard us talk about Anderson University and their QEP. Georgia State University also has from college to career. So the career readiness is also in their um, SAC COC uh, quality enhancement plan. So you can see that when you are able to kind of percolate things across the institution and really break down any silos and allow everyone to see that I can be a part of this, even if I am someone who is supervising a work study student, I can integrate this into my conversations and help that work study student see the benefits of that experience. So when it is in the fabric of the institution, it can make a huge substantial difference. And if we go to the next slide, what I'd like to point out with the state of Texas is if it's not even in your institution's overall strategic plan, there may be something at the state level that you can plug into. So if you're an institution joining us today from the state of Texas, I'm sure you're aware of the 60 by 30 um, Texas goals. And if you're not from the state of Texas, we've got some information here, but it is truly initiative statewide that they wanna put more educated individuals out into the state of Texas but also managing the student debt and making sure those students are completing the degree and have the marketable skills that they need to be able to articulate to employers the value that they can bring um, to the respective organizations. So this could be something that you plug into that's at that bigger level. And then finally, we'll wrap up with our data. And just like you saw with pillar one, like Tim said, it takes some time. So think tortoise and the hare, slow and steady wins the race. A lot of the vocabulary or getting it into those larger pieces is not something that happens super quick or overnight. So it will take time, but it will be worth the time because you'll be able to see what other things can you plug into in the institution that can make this be just an initiative and almost take it to a high impact practice, which is what we want at the end of the day. So, uh, Kathy, do we have any questions from anyone? We do, and I just want to jump in real quick first and just say, uh, you know, reiterate what, what Tim and Kristen have said so far with Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Um, what we found at Clemson is when we identified our partners and champions across campus and started the discussions with them, we weren't asking them to reinvent their programs or curricular to fit our initiative, but we were talking to them about what they were already doing um, and the fact that they were already doing some of these competencies and working together on creating that common language. You know, we were encouraging folks across campus to make the connections for students so that that aha moment was happening in the mind of the students. So we really believe we found such success in rolling out our initiative because of that. So I just wanted to, to pop in that little uh, comment there. Um, for those, we did have a couple questions about links to the full workbook. So I did provide direct links to the workbook and the full continuum rubric in the chat box. So if you uh, would like to see those, you can click on those links now. And then we have a question from Mason Murphy. Uh, and Mason says, both Clemson University and the University of Tampa have a strong history of offering quality co-op educational experiences. Could you talk a little bit about how you are working with these employers to incorporate the competencies into these types of multi-semester employment opportunities? Absolutely. So um, both on the internship and the cooperative education um, side, if there's any opportunity to um, encourage employers to incorporate the competencies, if they're not already there, into any sort of position descriptions, that can help bring it to the students that I need to acquire this or this is what that um, cooperative education teaching partner is looking for in applicants or those that they're interviewing, it kind of makes it resonate that then it's just not us saying you need to develop these things. It's, it gives some um, credence to that this really is what employers are looking for, whether it's on the internship or co-op side. So that's one thing. Um, one thing that we worked with um, our internal IT person to do within Simplicity was to actually add a drop down for our on campus internships. Which competencies are you looking for in an applicant or which competencies would a student develop? So it was a quick checkbox. So it wasn't a requirement for all positions. We did do it a requirement for on campus. But if you have the ability to adjust your system at all, that can be something that you do there. 
we also took the part where we can kind of control, if you will, the final evaluations or even midterm evaluations. We just looked at what we already had. A lot of it was framed in terms of knowledge, skills, and behaviors or abilities. Um, and we just reframed it to our competencies, which actually allowed us to take a couple things off, which anytime you can make a survey or an evaluation shorter and more meaningful, we're all for it. So we used that language. So we didn't even have to coach the employers necessarily on that piece, but we went ahead and changed that a little bit on our end. So then that way, again, we were speaking the same language. And then we also have the students do a self-assessment and then a final assessment of themselves and where they fall with the competencies. And I'll talk a little bit about that during pillar four, which focuses on assessment, but we built out five proficiency levels. If you're at all familiar with the ACPA and NASPA competencies, where it's foundational, intermediate, and advanced, we took five levels. Um, so that way it was also inclusive of both undergraduate and graduate students or some non-traditional students like student veterans, where at what level am I at with this competency? We have two bullet points that describe each proficiency level for each one of our nine competencies self-assess and what made you choose that and tell us a story about that at the end of the internship. So you can approach it with internships and co-ops or any other type of experiences and say, where am I, where do I wanna be? And if you are the one that are creating those final evaluations, what can you do to help adjust that? So hopefully that gives you a couple um, ideas on where you can um, enhance and help the competencies be part of that piece. And then I would say, if you have any opportunities where are you doing an info webinar or an in-person meeting, or if you have anything with any corporate partners or your teaching um, partners on the co-op side, can you help give some of this information? So I actually delivered these PowerPoints to our corporate partners several years ago to help them see that this is what we're doing, this is where the field is going, and here's how you can help us out with that. So a lot of neat things that you can do with that. Great question, appreciate that. Thank you, Kristen. Yes, we certainly found that uh, as career services, sometimes students view us as like mom and dad, okay, stop telling me that, stop telling me that, yeah, yeah, yeah. But as soon as an employer says it, ooh, boom, like they're bought in um, right away. So yes, the more you can incorporate your employers into these conversations, I think the more students are gonna latch onto them pretty quickly. Um, we do not have any other questions, so I'll pass it back over to Tim to start Pillar 3. Great, thanks Kathy. And uh, the only thing I'd add to what Kristen said, and I, I was remiss in not sharing this earlier um, when I talked about pillar one, but when we do talk about stakeholders, um, employers are stakeholders as, as Kristen really talked about. Um, and our employer advisory board was an integral part of the development of our competencies. Um, and once they were developed, it wasn't just that's the end of it. Um, but a, a continuous uh, conversation with them about their infusion of the competencies into the work that they're doing with our students um, is a part of this. Um, and uh, as Kristen talked about, the reflective components are one of the ways that they're doing that um, with our, our students as well. So um, it is important to have them uh, involved with this process. So perhaps my favorite pillar of all of these is pillar three, because we're gonna talk about the resources that it takes to do this. And um, I like this pillar a lot because uh, I think it really gets to the heart of some of the uh, misperceptions that we might uh, impose upon ourselves uh, and some of the barriers that we may put up even for ourselves. Uh, having to do with how am I going to get all of this done? We made a slight revision to this and you'll see the blue uh, in the first sentence is the revision. So when we talk about resources, we're talking about institution-wide competency infusion uh, may be achieved through new and repurposed human and financial resources and single departmental or collaborative initiatives. It's imperative to keep a pulse on trends and issues affecting higher education the evolving world to ensure that an institution-wide approach remains relevant. So there, there are two really major components to this. Um, we'll talk mostly about the first part of it, but I do want to touch on the second part. Um, and that's really to help us think about the fact that this is not once it's done, it's done, um, and we don't touch it again. 
it is important that we understand that whether we're doing new programs, repurposing programs, and how we have those uh, in, uh, competencies infused into those programs needs to be dynamic uh, in that our competencies may very well change. Um, and just to give you a little glimpse, um, in uh, June, NACE will be sending out some revised competency labels and definitions um, and competencies themselves for public comment. Um, so even NACE uh, is making certain that they stay relevant with uh, the trends um, and, and the competencies that are most important for our students to be successful. So we have to make sure everything we're doing is, is dynamic and, and can reflect those changes. So the things that we're considering here are what existing resources, programs, services, and tools do I already have that exist in my department or across the campus that I might be able to leverage? Um, so it's not just about creating new. I mean, it's, it's it, it frequently in conversations that I have with folks about competency development, uh, they say, I don't have the time, I don't have uh, the people, the staffing, I, I don't have the financial wherewithal to do these. Well, it's not about creating all new. It is about thinking about what already is out there uh, and might be adapted to mapping competency development to those existing programs. And also, what, what are the free re resources that are out there uh, that we could use uh, to help with this initiative? It's not all about paying for it, although I would say that we have some service provider partners who are doing some good work around competency development. And if you have financial wherewithal, you might want to look at, at some of those. But there are things that can help you. Uh, for example, ONET does a pretty good job of talking about competencies around careers, and that's a free resource and accessible to anyone. So just go beyond just the typical use of ONET to think about competency development as well. There may be circumstances where you do need funding, and like in an environment we're into today with COVID, uh, many of us are experiencing budget cuts. Um, so this is a time that is probably really important to see if there might be some grants available that will help support the work in this area if you do in fact need to use um, funds for new programs or resources. Um, and the other thing is you want to keep your campus informed and um, so you want to think about how am I, how am I keeping people uh, in the know about this. A very simple task that I do because I am always reading up on career services things and reading competency development information and trying to drive people to um, those resources and that information. I simply forward a lot of articles uh, to people that I think um, might have an interest in sharing that. And our campus partners, our, our faculty members uh, who are champions for this, um, are also forwarding articles and information out to their colleagues. That doesn't cost anything typically. It just takes a little bit of time to do. When I read it any, anyway, uh, it's easy to do a click uh, for email to send that on. So I want to give you some examples to pillar, from Pillar to Practice. At the University of Tampa, um, we use a, a university-wide calendar system called Trumba and our public information department created a means for us to tag any event that's going on to, on campus to a Spartan Ready competency. And so we have baccalaureate program, which is our first year experience, which all first year students are required to take, um, have built into the curriculum a requirement to do some uh, out of class experiences that are, are mapped to Spartan Ready competencies and specific ones that they might be talking about at that time. And so the students have the ability to pull the university calendar up uh, and then select the Spartan Ready competency that they are trying to develop 
um, and want to explore more. And it will bring up all of the programs, whether they're co-curricular in nature or maybe our honors program is, is having a lecture series or an event uh, that's open. Uh, something like that would pop up on, on the calendar. Uh, even campus rec program would pop up if it is mapped indeed and has reflective components for assessment around that competency and the students know then what programs they can attend. Indiana Wesleyan University in Marion, Indiana has indeed taken the internship program that they already had in existence um, and it asked employers to include in their job descriptions um, some reference and mapping to the NACE competencies that they're using for their institution-wide competency initiative um, so that students know what types of, of competencies they will have the opportunity to develop as a result of that experience. And then there is a reflective component uh, to that experience uh, in which they do some video chats with peers and do reflection around um, those competencies. Uh, and then the evaluation itself also includes uh, performance review around competency development. They also have taken their existing student employment area uh, and they're doing training with student employees uh, around the NACE competencies. Like Indiana Wesleyan, the University of Tampa has um, mapped learning uh, to some skill shops. And I want to give Valencia College uh, in Florida uh, credit for that title. Um, they were willing to let us share that uh, creative approach. And I know a lot of people are saying uh, out there periodically that, um, sorry, my mouse again, uh, workshops just aren't working. Well, I don't find that to be true at the University of Tampa. Now, not that we have just volumes of students attending these, I don't want to misrepresent that, but we have a good group of students that attend workshops that are mapped to our competencies and available for supervisors of student employees to send their students uh, to get some professional development. Not only are they feeding into that, but we have other programs across campus who are also mapping learning to the competencies. For example, we have a program called Crescent Scholars, which is uh, for underrepresented populations uh, and first gen students um, on our campus. Uh, and they have uh, a, a, a series of learning outcomes designed that include development of competencies. So they're having students funneled into this as well. And so there, there are a lot of places feeding into these workshops that increase the attendance. And you'll see we try to take a little bit more of a creative approach with them and not just say, hey, we're going to learn about teamwork. Um, we, we try to make it a creative title, creative approach. Um, and, and it's typically um, a little more interactive, less lecture based for students. We also worked with our residence life area on our campus. Um, it, it, RAs typically are required to do uh, some kind of programming um, each semester in the halls, uh, and they have a certain number of programs. And, and before, what was happening, it was kind of left the RAs, just come up with what you want to do, and, um, and that will be fine just as long as you do these programs. Well, the residence life area decided they wanted to actually create a curriculum and 60% of our students are, are in um, campus housing. So it really helps uh, because we're going to reach a lot of students in this way um, in that they mapped the, the curriculum that they call Spartan Living to the Spartan Ready competencies. So the programming that RAs are doing uh, now are um, based on the competencies and they have reflective components uh, that include assessment that helps students understand their growth as a part of that experience, but also the transferability onto to other uh, types of, of things that they're going to do in their life. Clemson has done a great job also of pivoting programs and experiences. So, for example, their academic success center tut tutors now um, frame rubrics around the competency. So while they're working with their students, on uh, discipline, they also have built in some ways to measure uh, competency development. And with peer mentors, um, they trained them to look at cover letters uh, from a perspective of, of competency development uh, beyond just whether or not a, a, a cover letter is, is going to meet the typical criteria needed uh, to be effective. 
Um, they do visits to student uh, leader groups um, and help engage them in these processes. And that includes things like uh, orientation ambassadors, um, RAs, uh, tour guides, uh, and Fraternity Sorority Life, for example, which is really low hanging fruit on our campuses because fraternities and sororities nationally typically have a professional development component. They're also uh, engaged in uh, seminar classes with career components. So when you look at Clemson's approach, and this would be true of the University of Tampa's as well, this is not just about uh, our staff going out and presenting information and engaging in this, but we're training others to deliver this as well. And that could be other faculty and staff uh, in departments, but it also could be students who can also help their peers grow in their competency development. Just a few quick brain primers for you to think about on your campus. We already mentioned a partnership with Fraternity Sorority Life. Campus Rec is a great place for you to, to reach out uh, and, and talk about competency development in their activities. Their national association, NURSA, is actually adapting uh, the NACE competencies as a part of uh, the work that they're doing uh, nationally uh, and encouraging their folks to do it at institutions. Leadership programs and experiences are a great opportunity to have uh, competency development and they, those programs typically already exist. Another way to think about this as well, it's not just about programs, but uh, if you have a, awards programs, for example, where you do leadership recognitions for students, we were experiencing this, this thing where people were just turning in for their, their award nomination, just this long list of things that they had already done. Um, we changed that, uh, that narrative a bit and asked them to talk about the impact that they had on campus, not just a list of what they've done, but give us an idea of the impact in the context in which you did that, and also talk about the Spartan Ready skills that you used. You can see that infusion into senior capstone courses and first year courses are important. Um, orientation, we already mentioned. Wellness, volunteer and civic engagement. Um, think broadly about the ways that you can engage with others. And this is not about your staff doing it necessarily, but building a collaborative uh, partnership with someone in, a, in another area of the institution to get them to uh, incorporate this into what they're already doing many times or collaborating on new possibly. So as you can see, see with our, our last year's response, um, immediately people did not go back and, and start on things, but about 50% of the respondents um, had taken action and were beginning to uh, develop um, some ideas uh, that they would that they would use in terms of resources on their campus. So we'll move on to questions at this point. And Tracy, do we have any questions? Yes, Tim, we do. Thank you for sharing that. Um, before we get to the question, um, I really like what you shared about not being distracted about just having something new, but really thinking about how we can repurpose what we have. And our really appreciated your example about the awards program and making sure that you're val valuing a true development. For our question, um, Eric Oswald from Notre Dame would like uh, to learn a little bit more about the skill shop calendar that you guys have in Tampa. He asked, um, who is in charge of flagging the Tampa events calendar with the right competency? How are they trained so the right ones get flagged? And can an event be associated with more than one competency? Great, thanks for the question, Eric. Um, so right now, um, I'm the person that is tagging those events. Um, so, and, and it, it does take some time, um, but it's, it's an important amount of time that I'm spending in, and it does not actually take all that long. Oftentimes I can see uh, and know the programs, and I know uh, the competencies that are provided. Many times um, staff will put in the competencies that will be addressed um, in those experiences, so I have the ability to uh, know from that. And yes, they can be tagged for multiple competencies. Um, so they're not always just focused on one. Our skill shops in particular 
do have a, a singular focus typically, but other kinds of experiences and events, we recognize that there's a potential for multiple competencies to, to, to be developed. Thank you, Tim. We'll go ahead and turn it over to Kristen for Pillar 4. Awesome. Thank you so very much. So everyone's favorite topic, get excited, assessment. So um, why I still love being part of this conversation is assessment is now everything that I do. I now serve as the director of assessment for our division of student affairs. So it's really fun being able to work with all of our departments to try to help integrate this wherever possible. And we still have some great um, movement that could occur. Um, but to give you a broader aspect, that's the role that I'm serving in now since Tracy is our um, champion now for this initiative at Clemson. So we did make some slight revisions for this for 2020. Um, so competency development should be assessed at the micro and macro levels in curricular and co-curricular experiences. Collecting outcomes data will help individual students realize developmental progress and institutions focus on continuous improvement. So a lot of pieces in here, even though it's one of our shorter pillars. So when we're looking at that micro and macro, it's that individual student. So as that student is completing that reflection in your internship course, or as a, or as a result of what I learned as a peer mentor or an academic tutor, but it's also looking at that macro piece. So those may be some of your nationally normed surveys or some things that can occur at that larger level to see where are you moving the needle um, in that um, arena, but also where might be some gaps that you need to work on as an overall institution. So it may be your overall institution QEP may not be career readiness, but it may need to focus in on a certain concept such as critical thinking. Um, but that assessment should be occurring both inside and outside of the classroom. And that's gonna be an important piece here because we do want students to see their own individual process but we also need to make sure that we are improving what we are delivering to ensure that we have congruence between our intended outcomes and what's actually occurring. So a couple discussion questions that we have here that you can think about related to assessment is what's currently happening? How can you do some pivoting? I'm a big fan of friends, so pivot is where it's at. You know, where can you adjust a little bit? And how can you adjust some of those questions so that way it can encompass? So again, as you're hearing us say over and over, it's not what new things are you doing, what can you repurpose? And that can include your uh, different survey tools that you might be using or reflection or rubrics. In terms of competence and confidence as it relates to the topic of assessment itself, some people are very intimidated by the area of assessment. It may not be something that graduate prep programs went into much detail on, or it's just not something that I have in my toolkit. So you may need to do some capacity building with that and increase people's confidence. So if, this, if you have a committee or task force or whatever group is the champion of this initiative, you may have to do some work, but again, how can you partner with your Office of Institutional Assessment or Research or um, Effectiveness to be able to maybe leverage what they're already doing to help do this? How can you point people up to those existing resources? Can you leverage enrollment management or institutional research with some possible predictive analytics that might be possible here? So again, not that you have to carry that burden, but how can you leverage your partners to be able to leverage what they're most good at to help you with this initiative? And most importantly, you need to share that data. We actually are sharing it at Clemson with our students, the Career Center, the data that um, Kathy has collected over the last couple years and now Tracy, how can we turn that back around to the students to help inform them about the competencies and what employers are looking for? So you can share the NACE data, which is wonderful data to be able to share at that nationwide aggregate level, but then for your own institutional level, what can you possibly share? That really helps to be able to bolster your response rate so that way you have more reliable data. So if we look here at the next slide, let's go over some different examples for pillar to practice on what assessment might look like. So like Tim shared, we have service partners and it may mean an investment there. The University of Tampa um, and Clemson was a first partner in this, but Tampa's really taking their partnership with Skills Survey to a next level with their career readiness project. And we have a link here where you can learn more broadly about that on Skills Survey's website. If you're unfamiliar with Skill Survey, the survey itself, 
It has actually been a reference tool that has been around for several years, where if me as the applicant has put Tim down as one of my references, he would get an email to complete an anonymous online reference for me, put a scale um, on different questions, um, and provide some overall feedback. And then as the hiring manager, if Lee's the hiring manager, she gets that aggregate report on how I rank in those different skill areas and some of my strengths and areas of opportunity. So if we advance to the next slide, what Skill Survey is hoping to do is to be able to leverage that about different applicants in different industries and allow us to see where our students stack up um, in terms of those different areas. So it's a wonderful tool from an individual student level for me to get that type of feedback. We were able to provide that to our interns in the pilot year at Clemson. So that's wonderful because they can self-assess, but then they can also compare that self-assessment to how um, a colleague or a supervisor evaluated them on these different competencies. So some interesting pieces here on how you might be able to um, collaborate with a uh, service provider. I'm also gonna put right now in the chat box a link to Campus Labs and Project CEO, where there's a collaboration there with the work that Dr. Adam Peck is doing, which is really wonderful on um, the co-curricular and leveraging that competency development. If you are a Campus Labs campus, there's also some free assessment things that you can do there as well. So just some examples around um, leveraging relationships with different service providers and what that might be able to um, assist you with. So in looking at some other examples um, that we have related to assessment is some work that we've done here at uh, Clemson. We've got a screenshot here of our resource page. Um, and when we post this online for you, you'll be able to click on this. But I think Kathy's actually already provided this link to you is we provided a toolkit of different things, even down to the logo that we have for the competency. But it also has that self assessment that I was referring to earlier. So uh, different faculty and staff members and students can just download that and take that self-assessment and where they are on the proficiency levels. Um, we also assess, like I was sharing earlier, in our on and off-campus internships as well as our international internships to make sure that our students are identifying where they're moving and also figuring out, I don't need to move and focus on all nine areas in absolutely everything that I do. I can make those strategic decisions and be aware of where I'm making progress. We also added a question to our post-counseling survey so we could analyze, did we talk about the competencies with you? Yes or no? So a very simple question, but it allowed us to see as we were getting our counselors all trained and incorporating this into their dialogue with students, were ironically, were we doing a really great job when we only had 10 to 15 minutes with a student, but is the topic passing the student by when it might be a 30 or 60 minute conversation? So even adding that type of simple question to our counseling survey allowed us to see how we were doing. We also added a question about competency development to our first destination survey as we started to saturate our student population enough that they got to be at that graduation level. Did somebody connect with you on this topic? And then employer feedback. I've already talked about the evaluations from experiential learning, but it was also during the recruiting process, during on-campus and after-fair interviews. So we asked our employers, how proficient does a student need to be for an opportunity, say, in your human resources position or your finance or mechanical engineering position? And how well did that student or group of students do in articulating their competencies there? So it allowed us to get some real-time feedback there uh, from our employers. So there's a lot of different things that you can do here. So that's just a glimpse of what we were doing at Clemson. And looking at um, another example, the University of Minnesota in their College of Liberal Arts, they call it their Advantage. They have a really neat and intriguing website there. And they are actually delivering some online content that then is followed up by assessments. Um, kind of a little similar if you've seen career spots, uh, similar to that. So that is another way that you can do it, where it may be the in-person assessment that you're doing after one of Tim's skill shops, but it may also be some assessment that occurs with the recording of an online module. So that can also measure some learning that occurs there, both at the individual student and at that um, macro or aggregate level. 
And then we've got what's going on at K-State 360. They've, or, sorry, actually I fast forwarded one. Um, the University of South Florida, they have their career readiness badging um, program. And there's some other institutions, I believe University of Houston has something similar. One of the challenges though that our friends at um, South Florida and Houston have articulated is that in doing the reflections and leveraging some sort of system, say like a Campus Labs Engage with the curricular pathways where you can do that reflection, is somebody's gotta look at that. But I think it's really neat to reflect again and back on what the University of Michigan at Dearborn is doing, where they're actually training students to help them review all of those reflections. So I think that's a really great opportunity to get students involved. And if you can develop a really strong rubric, it would be um, easier to involve more in the assessment of students learning through different reflections. So kudos to South Florida and the work that they're doing with their badging program. And then finally, with uh, K-State 360, they um, developed their own in-house piece of identifying different events that you can go to. And again, what are the competencies that I, as a student, may be able to further develop by attending this program? And I believe there is a reflection piece that they have within this app as well. So this is something where if you don't have the means to outsource to something else or have an outside platform like a Campus Labs or a Presence, um, that you might be able to work internally with your own IT department to develop something that your students can use to help track their experiences and reflect on the learning. Um, so a lot of these different areas can have um, some impact to help um, emphasize the area of assessment to help you continuously improve, but also help students see where they are as individuals and identify where they want to be. So again, this is an area that I'm always surprised with every year with our assessment, that as much um, apprehension as individuals have about the topic of assessment, it's usually where the majority of our responses are highest um, in terms of that middle area with four to seven. So 43 responses there, almost 39% um, is really good. But again, that four month out, once people have some opportunity to invest in this um, topic, we can see some movement that occurs there. So that's definitely what we like to see. So we'll pause for questions before I wrap us up with some um, qualitative pieces and some extra tools to add to your toolkit. Thank you, Kristen. No uh, questions so far, but I wanted to say that I think you made a great point um, in the beginning when you said, you know, start with your current assessments that you have and make some tweaks. I think that's a really great suggestion for helping people get started if they have concerns about creating those, those new assessments. Sometimes when you sit in meetings, it's the not it mentality of I don't want to, I don't want to have to create it. So looking at what you're currently doing and see if you can just reframe that language. Um, and then just touching back on service providers, you know, uh, we at Clemson have loved brainstorming with the various service providers out there to help develop some resources. Um, for students to do these self-assessments. So we're hoping to see more service providers come out with some of these tools that are customizable for, for campus like campuses like Clemson and, and others out there who have developed initiatives that are slightly different than uh, the NACE, NACE competency competencies. So if you haven't had discussions yet with skill survey or, or career spots or some of those other uh, service providers out there, we, we really strongly encourage you to start having those discussions with them. So no questions came in while I was blabbering on there. So I will turn it over to you to finish us out. Perfect. So to follow our construction analogy, it's time for the punch list to close out with tools and next steps. Um, so just to give you a little bit of um, information here, this just allows you to see the data that we've already shown you, just everything together on one slide with the four pillars. So you can see a lot of movement occurs. And again, this is on a 10 point scale. So this graph um, is brought down to a six just to help show that differentiation and growth over time. So again, here our message that this doesn't happen overnight. And we know that with this time of modified operations at our various institutions, Patience is a virtue. So every little thing that you can do, celebrate those milestones because it really will make a difference. As we look at our next slide and some of the components of pillars to not overlook, um, these were interesting things that we found in the qualitative data at our four month out is the importance of that upper level administrative support. 
So where can you gain some initial traction and leverage the current relationships that you have so that way you can bring them on board and help them be advocates. And again, slow and steady wins the race and have realistic timelines. It does take time. If you do feel as though that you need to develop your own competencies, pause and take the time to do it right rather than rush it. Think about how different initiatives have gained traction at your respective institution and kind of follow that because that may help you in terms of who to talk to and what are the processes and who do we need to strategically be, um, bring on board. Um, again, you know, connect with different colleagues wherever possible in terms of IE and IR or assessment committees because there may be some similar discussions occurring at your campus that this is a nice thing to bring together with it. Um, staffing at home and turnover. You'll see some of the roadblocks here in a moment that people can turn over in positions. So where does this live? What is its home? So that way you can make sure from a business continuity standpoint, how does it not lose traction as employees will and are bound to turn over? Um, and start with why. Um, that's really important. If you're talking with faculty, maybe leveraging AAC and U. I didn't mention the value rubrics during the assessment piece. But if you don't have the time or you're using the NACE competencies, leverage the AAC and U value rubrics that are free for anybody to download. And you now have rubrics around concepts such as oral or written communication and critical thinking. Um, so find your why and find how you can approach um, the topic and how do you change your pitch based on who you're speaking with. So that way you can get that momentum um, and that buy-in as you need it. As we look at our next slide, um, in terms of our overall qualitative uh, takeaways with action is, again, that language and appeal to stakeholders. We can't overstate that enough. So don't say the acronym if you're one of our career friends. Don't just say NACE. Remember, almost like writing a research paper. What is NACE? Who are they? So make sure that you are um, being inclusive with your language and helping to build that um, momentum and how you are literally um, uh, approaching it, uh, the topic. Making sure that you're connecting competencies to existing things. If you have some sort of co-curricular framework, how can this plug into it? Not be an add-on where, okay, we're doing all these separate things. I don't understand how they come together. So if something does exist, where can you plug that in? and leverage that committee or task force to possibly take some of that uh, burden off of that group. So just some things to think about there with how you, again, you can um, leverage that committee or task force that our colleagues across the country, when they take the survey, say that's really helped us what is um, get things off the ground and maintain momentum. And then if we look next with, um, I believe, our, our, our roadblocks and anticipated and unexpected, and I think it's really interesting that these are two separate questions and yet some of the things come up both in the same. And I think that's truly representative of the variety of different institutions when they've tried to assemble an initiative like this. So take these things as part of um, what you're thinking about as you're initiating your initiative or how you're helping initiative go to a next level is what is the context of my institution and what are some of those resistant standpoints that I can anticipate and maybe even ask colleagues at other institutions, what are you experiencing? Because it might help you um, identify an uh, unexpected roadblock and be able to actually mitigate that challenge uh, before it becomes one. So just some things to think about there. And then we'd like to, um, again, just remind you that these tools, um, most of them are available right now on the website that Tracy and Kathy have been sharing with you in the chat feature. Um, we will be adding both the recording from yesterday and today. Our recordings, Tim, uh, would you say we've given almost identically the same information from yesterday and today? Pretty, pretty close. Awesome. So, and we didn't have a perfect script, so that's good. So just to save you time, you don't need to watch both and think that we shared examples from different institutions, but both of those recordings are there. So if you want to share those with colleagues, you can, and you also have those blueprints. We would like to note that the person who is a point of contact on the last two years of blueprints may have changed. So for example, Tracy was the contact for AU Pro with Anderson, but now she's gonna be your contact for Clemson. But it at least gives you a starting point of some additional ideas that we didn't cover today that our colleagues are doing across the country. And again, we can't stress um, how wonderful the workbook is and the great feedback that we get on that. 
Um, so the fact that you can download that and share it with as many folks that you want, it provides some additional charts, some action planning tools uh, for the next 12 months. It talks about the relationship continuum. So take advantage of those resources um, as you build off of the ideas that you've gotten today on how you can take your initiative to the next level. And then finally, some additional resources that we wanted to provide that other folks have created is NACE does have a lot of free resources that you don't have to have and be a member of the National Association of Colleges and Employers. So feel free to go there if you need some nuggets to support your work, even some data, they have some things to share for you. Um, as well as some crowdsourced information. So feel free to check that out. Um, we also have some books, um, which then, just like our faculty taught us, look at the references section, and that points you to more resources um, and journal articles to support your work. So these are some topics of books that are available to you and a recent article that came out. Um, there is a webinar that's occurring next week from the Chronicle, The Soft Skills Gap. So I provided a link here for you, or you can just Google it and register. There's some interesting um, topics and some folks, I believe from the New York Times that are gonna be on that webinar. So I thought you all may wanna enjoy it. And there's also a podcast that came across my email yesterday afternoon. So I added this in here, the role of higher education and skills development. So just some additional things, resources, information to add to your toolkit as you are talking with the different stakeholders at your respective institutions. And then if you are um, looking to join us, these were some benefits um, that folks identified as some concrete things that were beneficial by actually attending the symposium. We know we weren't be able to perfectly mimic our symposium atmosphere since we were kind of talking more at you today. Our normal symposium is very organic and is focused on diving in with conversations with one another. So we really like hearing these benefits and we thought it might be beneficial to share them with you in case you are thinking about um, attending since we know that funds, if they exist at all, will be very limited um, in terms of travel related to professional development, but we wanted to share that with you. And then our next slide, I believe it says that 99% of our folks said just do it in terms of attending the event, which makes us feel really good about that. Um, so again, like Tim said, if you are looking for the silver bullet, that magic recipe of here's exactly how to do it, it can be frustrating, like our students say, there's no one one way to write a perfect resume. It depends. Hopefully you've learned a lot of this in implementing an initiative really depends on your context. But I hope we've really shared a lot of different ideas to get you thinking today and realizing to take that context into consideration and figuring out which pillars you wanna work on and how best to approach this and realizing that time really is your friend to be able to do it and build something that will sustain to support your student success. So with that, anything else that my colleagues wanna share with our attendees before we sign off for today? We didn't have any um, last questions in the, in the chat room um, from our punch list. So um, we just wanna thank everyone for attending and listening to um, what we shared about career competencies and hope that you've taken away um, some good some good ideas and some good steam uh, to get you going into the summer. Um, just remember to take small bites and just get started. I think that last slide was a great one, um, not just about our competency conference, but to just do it. It seems like a big daunting task, but just get started. Start talking to people um, and, and see how far that can carry you. So we will provide all these resources to you. Thank you again for joining us. Um, we've enjoyed sharing uh, all of our uh, stories and what we've learned about competencies and hope you guys have a great uh, summer. Take it and run with it. We can't wait to see what you do. Have a great day, everybody. Okay. Hi, it's so nice to see everyone now. So they will send it out, um, so I think that's good, because then we can share it with everyone else. So. And then we need to go to. ahead and hit our stop recording. Sorry, bathroom break. 
So the second time around flowed a little better. Yeah, that was great. Are we still recording? No, we are. <laughs> <laughs>